The United Nations sounds the alarm on the growing humanitarian crisis in the Democratic Republic of Congo as millions are displaced. Could the key to weight loss be mind over matter? And a Ghanaian artist depicts the faces of the elderly as gateways to the soul. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidu. You are in for Vincent Macquarie. This is Africa 54. The humanitarian crisis in the Democratic Republic of Congo is worsening with more than 13 million people in dire need of assistance. Militia violence has risen since President Joseph Kabila's refusal to step down when his constitutional mandate expired in 2016. Another 4.5 million people have been forced to flee their homes as a result of fighting in other parts of the country while epidemics are spreading, including the worst outbreak of cholera in 15 years. The United Nations Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator Mark Lowcock wrapped up a two-day mission to the country where he visited two camps for internally displaced people in Kalemi in the southeastern province of Tanganyika. The situation is very bad and the single biggest problem we have is we're short of funds to meet the needs of these people. We're appealing this year for $1.7 billion uh, for humanitarian assistance in Congo. That's twice as much as we appealed for last year because the problem is twice as bad. As a result of the growing crisis, the European Commission, the Netherlands and the United Arab Emirates are scheduled to co-host the first ever humanitarian donor conference for Congo next month. A 22-year-old Eritrean man has died of tuberculosis brought on by severe malnutrition after being rescued at sea and brought to Italy, according to aid workers. Huge numbers of migrants have converged in Libya in recent years with the hope of crossing the Mediterranean Sea to Europe. Many of those who avoid drowning are arriving in Italy in terrible physical condition. On Monday, a ship ran by Proactiva Open Arms, a Spanish charity, brought 93 people, including the Eritrean, to Italy after rescuing them on Sunday from an overcrowded rubber boat off Libya. The head of the local hospital's emergency services says the man known as Segen disembarked in Pozzalo, a port on the southern coast of Sicily, weighing only 35 kilograms, and was immediately taken to hospital where he died less than 12 hours later. Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari and his administration continues to struggle with protecting schoolgirls in northeast Nigeria from the Islamic militant group Boko Haram. Nigeria's president told the parents of 110 abducted schoolgirls on Wednesday that he has ordered all military and security agencies to search for them. In his first visit to their hometown since the suspected Islamist militant kidnapped them a month ago. At the start of a tour of security hotspots across Nigeria, Buhari said he has instructed the army, air force, police and the rest of the security agencies to find the girls wherever they may be. The attack on the town of Dapchi in Yobe state on February 19th was the biggest mass abduction since Boko Haram seized more than 270 schoolgirls from the town of Chibok in 2014. A Ugandan legislator, Anesmas Twinamasiko, has provoked widespread outrage after NTV television station aired footage in which he encouraged men to beat their wives as a way to discipline them. The remarks followed a speech by Uganda's President Yoweri Museveni on Women's Day on March 8th, in which he condemned domestic violence. Uganda's parliament has condemned the legislator's remarks, and the Speaker of the House has called on a disciplinary committee to look into his conduct. Here's what, he, what the legislator said. As a man, you need to discipline your wife. You need to, you know, touch her a bit, and you tuck her hand, you beat her somehow. You know, to really streamline her, to, 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 to enable her really get on the line. The legislator's remarks quickly triggered a flood of condemnation on social media and among fellow Ugandans. It is a serious concern where this honorable member of parliament says at least the women have got to be touched a little to strengthen them, to align them as if we are motor vehicles, as if we are the goods. Right, honorable speaker, it is a high time. The men in this 
country knew that we are human beings just like them. Women have equal rights as well as men and uh, violating their rights, uh, 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 of course, d demands prostitution. So we cannot accept that. They're supposed to be respected. They're the mothers of the country. We've just celebrated Women's Day recently, so we have to respect them. When he was sworn into parliament and swore to protect the constitution, so should he retract all the words that he said on that day, make a public apology to all the women in this country and actually the whole country because he's abrogating the constitution that he swore to protect on that day and he was holding up in his, ha in his right hand as he was taking office as member of parliament for Buganga East. Beating does not really tell that you love someone. Beating is hurting someone. Even if it is your kid and you are trying to put him or her straight, you don't have to beat him or her. You just have to talk to her, show her the love, then she will change to what you want. So beating is not totally love. I disagree with that 100%. According to government data, about half of Ugandans believe that domestic violence is justified under certain circumstances, such as when women neglect children or, or burn food. However, it is a crime under the country's laws that penalize various forms of assault. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization has its roots in Europe and North America. But as the alliance faces new global threats, it has begun to broaden its horizons. VOA's Yela Di Franceschi takes a closer look at how North Korea's missile and nuclear buildup has led NATO to boost its engagement in the Asia-Pacific region. While North Korea may have signaled its intent to suspend nuclear tests in return for a summit between Kim Jong-un and U.S. President Donald Trump, NATO's concerns over Pyongyang's nuclear ambitions remain. The alliance's top civilian leader, Jens Stoltenberg, recently described North Korea as a global threat. This behavior uh, of North Korea is a global threat and requires a global response, and that of course also includes uh, 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 NATO. I agree with the Secretary General with capabilities that are uh, beyond regional. Um, at some point soon, their, their missiles will be able to hit not just the United States, but Europe and other places. It takes unity and strong partnerships, those that span the Atlantic and the Pacific, to counter the prospect of a nuclear-armed North Korea, adds Barry Pavel. The question of NATO in the Pacific used to be, well, is NATO going to go to the Pacific? But I think the key question now is the Pacific is coming to NATO. While serving at NATO from 2003 to 2006, General James Jones met with officials from the Asia-Pacific region. I had visits from Australia. I uh, had visits from Pakistan, believe it or not, um, and other countries from different parts of the world wanting to know more about NATO. So this, to me, this is, this is the future of NATO. I hope that NATO's global aspirations are measured. Uh, I wouldn't do this quickly. I, I would start with uh, partnerships and see how that goes. NATO has four partners in the Pacific, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and South Korea. Australia and New Zealand have deployed troops under the NATO banner in Afghanistan. Japan and South Korea have made big contributions to reconstruction and development efforts there. All four have taken part in NATO missions to fight piracy off the coast of Somalia, and all four have signed formal partnership agreements with NATO. Further afield, Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore all seem interested in partnering with NATO, say experts. India and Indonesia might also look for strong ties to such a group. In an age of globalized insecurity, it is natural for the Western alliance to expand its mandate, says former top NATO commander Jones. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization to be simply a, a reactive alliance that is to defend Europe, if you will, minus, uh, minus Russia, seems to be uh, a very expensive proposition that, that Russia doesn't have the, the force that it would need to defeat Europe. NATO has seen its primary focus evolve since its founding in 1949. In the 1950s, the alliance was a bulwark against the Soviet threat. In the 1960s and 70s, it was a political instrument for detente. 
In the 1990s, the alliance was a tool for stabilizing Eastern Europe and Central Asia, incorporating new partners and allies. Now in the 21st century, NATO is evolving again as it faces new global risks entailing global defense. Jela De Franceschi, Washington, VOA News. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Coming up, could the power of the mind help in the fight against obesity? Stay with us. is a country that I chose to become a citizen. I didn't have to become a citizen. I chose to become a citizen. I feel like America gave me an opportunity to pursue my passion as an artist. I really believe that clean eating is, is a way to a more successful life or, or a happier life, if, if you want to put it that way. One of the things that helps me wake up every morning is doing better being better. We grew up poor and so I'm always focused on helping the working class be able to have a more comfortable lifestyle. I'm passionate about doing justice every day. Um, I oftentimes say that justice is a verb, not a noun. You know, I believe in action and moving the ball forward. It's time now for our health report and joining us now is Africa 54 health correspondent Lino Mudu with a link between hearing loss and smoking. Lino? Hello Esther. While smokers may be more likely to develop hearing loss than non-smokers and the risk increases with each additional cigarette people smoke on a typical day, a Japanese study suggests. Researchers examined data on almost 50,000 Japanese workers ages 20 to 64 who didn't have hearing loss. After a maximum follow-up of eight years, more than 5,100 people developed hearing loss. Compared to non-smokers, people who currently smoked up to 10 cigarettes a day were 40% more likely to develop high-frequency hearing loss and 10% more likely to develop low-frequency hearing loss, the study found. While the study wasn't a controlled experiment designed to prove whether or how smoking might cause hearing loss, the researchers say it's possible that nicotine exposure may damage the ears. Finland is the world's happiest country, according to an annual UN report toppling Norway from the top spot. The UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network's 2018 World Happiness Report ranked 156 countries according to their scores for things such as GDP per capita, social support, healthy life expectancy, social freedom, generosity, and absence of corruption. Finland rose from fifth place last year to oust Norway from the top spot. Burundi was the least happy, taking over from Central African Republic. Observers say Nordic countries regularly appear in the top five, while war-hit countries and a number of sub-Saharan African countries regularly appear in the bottom five. The United States came in at 18th, down from 14th place last year. We obviously have a social crisis in the U.S. and a health crisis. The social crisis is more inequality, less trust, less confidence in government. This is pretty stark in the U.S. And at the same time, the health crisis is we have an opioid epidemic, an obesity epidemic, a major depressive disorder epidemic, depression. 
So uh, the signs are not good for the U.S. that uh, richer and richer, but not getting happier. And this year's report also features data about the happiness of immigrants in their host countries, with Finland again also coming top as home to the happiest immigrants. Now, the problem of obesity worldwide has tripled since 1975, according to the World Health Organization, and it's not just a problem in high-income countries such as the United States. A growing number of people are being diagnosed as overweight and obese in low- and middle-income countries as well. Here is VOA's Elizabeth Lee. Los Angeles resident Kathleen Mulcahy has been fighting with her weight for 55 years. My parents had a baby, a son, and he died at birth. And so that was sort of, I was seven, and I think that was the time I started gaining weight. My mother died when I was 12 very suddenly, and then my weight just escalated. She is not alone. A growing number of people are overweight or obese, particularly in urban areas worldwide, including developing countries. Fast foods, transnational corporations, soft drink companies going into these developing countries are having a, a very huge influence on the overweight and obesity epidemic because they're adding calories and processed foods, salt and sugar into the diet that these people have not normally been eating. People's lifestyles are also changing in developing countries. As people urbanize and make more money and have more sedentary lives, they are also putting on weight and following the pattern of the United States. Psychotherapist Dina Solomon says there is also another reason why people are gaining weight globally. You know, people are moving, moving away from their family of origin. They don't have a support system that's going to help them also manage and have relationships as options for dealing with stress. So people are turning to food. While fad diets may help with quick weight loss, keeping off the weight is more of a challenge. At sustaining that weight loss, the studies overwhelmingly show that plant-based diets are good long-term. You're motivated. You Instead of focusing on what you eat, Solomon helps people maintain weight loss by working with the mind to change a person's eating behavior. She helps her clients, like Mulcahy, be more self-aware by having them write down everything they eat before they eat. That awareness, that sense of conscientiousness becomes more powerful than the immediate gratification of food. But you have to learn it. It has to become a habit. It's worked for Mulcahy, who has sustained her current weight for almost three years. You get such a sense of accomplishment and a sense of power and efficacy that you can apply it to everywhere. Maintaining a healthy weight not only helps with a positive self-image, but it will also fend off health problems such as heart disease, diabetes, and even some forms of cancer. Elizabeth Lee, VOA News, Los Angeles. And that's our report for today. To stay in touch, find me on Twitter at Lenore Moudou. Esther, back to you. Leno, thanks. Be sure to watch Leno Mudu's health reports every Tuesday and Thursday right here on Africa 54. Thousands of students rallied across the United States on Wednesday demanding an end to gun violence. Michael Sullivan reports the school walkouts and memorials came one month after the school shooting in Parkland, Florida, that claimed 17 lives. Students gathered on the streets of New York City. Every day, students are dying and no one's doing anything about it. And we don't like it. And enough is enough. We will not be silent. And Atlanta. I'm fighting for gun control and to stop gun violence. In Oakland, they remembered the victims in Florida. Look, look, look. I don't want to be a victim. Through speeches and music. To another type of and also the victims of gun violence closer to home. Like I had a cousin that got shot, he was just walking down the block and I got my friend Davon, he got shot, he, they just talked about him. Yeah, I got a couple friends that got shot, family members that have been paralyzed. A somber school assembly in Ottawa, Illinois honored the 17 killed in Florida. Students say it was not a political event or against gun ownership. It really wasn't. We're just trying to help people feel safe while being here at school. How to end the violence? 
Some students want a ban on high-powered assault weapons like the one used in Florida. Others want to raise the age for buying guns, hire more armed school police, or even armed teachers. The debates are emotional, but these students say that something must be done. If we don't make a change, it will never stop. It will be the same thing. Hear about the shooting, cry about it, move on. The gun issue has made this student an activist in her home state of California. Again. We want state legislators to know that we want our voices to be heard. I think given Parkland's shooting victims and they've risen up and they've had a whole legislation movement in Florida, it's kind of inspired me personally to use my voice. For some, the message highlights students' safety. For others, that students can make a difference. The youth are learning that we have a voice. And as we're getting older, we're learning that we can use that voice to make a difference and to make change. Renewed activism from a new generation of students. Mike O'Sullivan, VOA News, Los Angeles. It's time now for a short break still to come on Africa 54. What do the faces of the elderly tell us? One young artist is on a quest to find out. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. Meet the lady known as Titanium. As South Africa's first woman amateur champion in mixed martial arts, Shana Power defies the stereotypes about women in a combat sport with her ferocity in the ring. Born in Johannesburg, the 25-year-old was first attracted to MMA by such star fighters as American Holly Holm and wanted to do the same in her homeland. Power says she was supported by the people who trained her in MMA and now trains and inspires others herself. She says she's, she's been treated fairly, except perhaps for the prize money. Next up, Libyans traveled back in time in a Tripoli street festival held to celebrate their traditional clothing. The annual festival celebrates the country's cultural heritage and sheds light on traditional clothes that had been worn in ancient times and up until early 20th century. Women dress in what is known as the farashea, a piece of cloth wrapped around their body, covering everything except for one eye. Men wear the jard, also a large piece of cloth wrapped diagonally over their torsos and heads, while children were adorned in gold-threaded attire and jewelry. And from North Africa to the subcontinent, premier Indian designers showcased their autumn winter collection on the inaugural day of the 31st edition of Amazon India Fashion Week in New Delhi. Among the trends, Central Asian motifs of Uzbekistan, popular Northern Indian traditional embroidery, and androgynous patterns. Of course, there was also color, lots and lots of color, a signature of Indian fashion, and that's what's trending today. Beauty, they say, is in the eyes of the beholder. And for 24-year-old Ghanaian artist Kwesi Bochwe, the gray and wrinkles of old age are enough to grace his works of art. The artist is working on a series of portraits that capture the beauty and depth in the faces of the elderly. Some of his works are already gaining international attention. We get more in the story produced by our partner, Channels TV in Nigeria. 
For many photographers, looking through the lens of their camera at young, beautiful faces makes for stunning pictures. But not Kwesi Bochwe, one of Ghana's young, up-and-coming artists who is inspired by old age. Today, his model is Sarah Labi, a 90-year-old retired teacher. Bochwe has been working on the series called Age of No Return for the last two years. Paintings for the collection have already featured in exhibitions in the United States, South Africa and parts of Europe because it's it's more to me it's more like the 24 year old started drawing while in school and what seemed like a distraction from books at the time turned out to be a talent that developed when he went to art school um, I think it all started when I was in primary I used to sketch a lot like I don't focus on reading much I used to sketch a lot like I have I feel like I was having a lot of love for for, for drawing so um, when going to school, I used to sketch my teacher when she was teaching. Every time she feel like she would be like, crazy, you don't learn." Like so, she felt that the love for art was was so much for me. So after my JH my JHS, she was like, "I have to focus. I have to go to an art school." Bachwe grew up in Nima, a slum in Accra, where he drew inspiration for his earlier works. He has also done a series on vulnerable children and the physically disabled, groups of people that are largely underrepresented in art. He says the focus on the elderly is hopeful and an appreciation of their wisdom and contribution to society, which is often taken for granted. I had the idea of Age of No Return series whilst living with my family because I grew up in a very um, big compound house where I saw a lot of old, old people and also um, with a lot of young generations. Um, well, I have seen young people throwing insult to um, the older people and not giving them the much respect that they needed which for me, I think they should be our role models. They should be people that we have to look up to. They should be people that we have to learn so much from because they have lived life with experience. Bachwe also specializes in portraits. He says looking into the faces of his aging models, particularly their eyes, brings him closer to his subject such that he is able to capture and relay the emotions on canvas. And that's our show for today. Thank you for watching. And good night from Washington. Welcome to English in a Minute. Today's episode won't cost you anything. Freebie. Let's see what this one is about. Anna, I love my job. Oh yeah? Why is that? I get so many freebies from the bands I write about. CDs, t-shirts, water bottles, even tickets to see them perform. Wow. The only freebie I ever got from my...